So welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Helmut Hof. I'm a faculty member at the School of uh, Mathematics. And it, it's a great privilege to introduce today's speaker. Augustin Moreno was raised in Montevideo and his family roots are in large part in Spain, namely in the autonomous province La Rioja, which is very well known for high quality wines and presumably <laughs> in the future also for great mathematics. So, <laughs> Um, Augustine, uh, rece Augustine received his bachelor degree in 2012 from the Faculty of Science of the Universidad de la República in Montevideo. And in 2014, he obtained his master's degree from the University of Cambridge. He then entered a PhD program at the University College London and moved with his PhD advisor, Chris Wendel, to the Humboldt University in Berlin, where he obtained his PhD in 2018. After postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Augsburg, Germany, Uppsala University, and the Mittag Leffler Institute in Sweden, he became a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study here in fall uh, 2021. Shortly afterwards, the University of Heidelberg uh, in Germany confirmed our good taste and hired him as a junior professor. Fortunately, uh, they allowed him to stay this academic uh, semester. So Augustine in his age group belongs to a small group of leaders in his discipline. There he is distinguished by his mathematical breadth, uh, ranging from pure to applied mathematics. His mathematical interests lie in symplectic geometry and its interactions, symplectic field theory and related Fleur theories, holomorphic curves and foliations, geometric structures and Hamiltonian dynamical systems and celestial mechanics, presumably most of the words don't mean too much for from, from, from many of you. However, he has further interest in mathematical physics and practical applications, and he currently works with a NASA engineer to use the machineries developed in the last 30 years to improve numerical tools uh, for orbit designs for space missions. So Augustine is not only a great mathematician, but also a cellist, and he has performed regularly as a soloist in orchestras and in various ensembles. So as the Rioja wine perfectly marries, and I cite, coconut scented American oak with the plush red fruit of Spain's native Tempranillo grape, Augustine marries insights with mathematic, deep insights with mathematical virtuosity and exceptional taste for picking important problems in, pure and in the pure and applied mathematical domain. Um, before I give Augustine the floor, let me also give a shout out to Ed Bruno, who is sitting in the second row there, but all by himself, almost. <laughs> and um, uh, Ed is famous for introducing in 1919 chaos theory into space travel. His principle was the, the more chaos there is, the le less fuel is needed, is now, <laughs> is, is now implemented in all major scientific missions. Now, the thing is, of course, besides the mathematical problems he had to deal with, uh, he had to in convince engineers that they should use chaos. Now, if you are a NASA engineer, engineers are very conservative, in particular if it's expensive. So if you have a space mission which costs a billion dollars and it goes wrong and you have to appear in front of a congressional panel and have to explain that your mission is built on chaos, then you can imagine <laughs> what the questions are. <laughs> and so uh, he was saved by the fact that a Japanese mission went wrong and, um, and so on. But it sets the tone what, what actually Augustine and so on to achieve can be used the newly developed methods to get more insight about the orbit structure of a seemingly, you know, you, you deal in the three body problem with three bodies. And it is extremely difficult to understand what the structures and so on are, but it's uh, quite relevant for space exploration and so on. And it's always a testing case for new mathematical ideas. So now I give the floor to Augustine. Was it good? You're happy? Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you, Helmut, for the fantastic introduction. I, I blushed without even drinking wine, so I'm shocked. Um, so um, as the title says, I mean, 
I will try to put a bit into historical context um, some of the ideas that we use currently today in our research. Um, so the main driving forces are very, yeah, oh, all right. Is that better? Yeah, yeah thank you. So uh, as I was saying, um, so I will try to motivate historically some of, some of the ideas that we use today in our research. And one of the main driving forces in this whole discussion will be a very classical problem, as Helmut already mentioned, the three-body problem. So this is the situation in which one obtains when one takes three planets, for example, and lets them interact with each other according to gravity. So one gets some very chaotic system. Uh, so I'll try to sort of describe a bit of the ideas that this generated. You know, this is a very old problem, has been around since Newton and still relevant today, uh, not only from a theoretical point of view, but also for practical applications as Helmut was trying to describe, okay? So I think it is fair to say that, you know, humanity, we humans are very curious creatures by nature, so we have been interested in the motion of planets and stars since the beginning of mankind. Um, but really the first records that we have surviving today of systematic astronomical observations date back at least to the Babylonians. So these were the first group of people that realized that astronomical phenomena is periodic in some sense. And they were the first to try to use mathematical methods in order to make predictions, to calculate the periods of the planets, to locate them in the sky as, uh, the days of the year go by, uh, and they recorded their observations in these tablets, which were made of clay, and some of them survived to this day, and they're actually the oldest records that we have, and they were written in cuneiform, which is one of the oldest writing systems that we have in humanity. Um, but in order to make accurate predictions and try to uh, tell what the planets will be in the future, how can we actually try to model the motion of the planets, at least geometrically, so that we actually can see them in the sky. So one of the oldest models in this direction, models for the solar system, is due to Claudius Ptolemaeus. So this was around 150 AD. So what Ptolemaeus did, he, he came up with a, with a system which is called a geocentric model. So he puts the Earth at the center of the universe. So he had a rough time at the time because he had to come up with a theory that was able to predict, but was also that also matched the scientific conceptions at the time, right? So this was left from the work of Aristotle in the antiquity. Like we all know that the perfect, the most perfect geometric shape is a circle. So of course the planets, which are heavenly bodies and they're incorruptible, of course they will move in a perfect circle. And of course, you know, the earth is at the center of the universe. What else would, would be at the center of the universe? Right? So he had to, he had the tension of uh, coming up with a theory that was correct, but also follow these preconceptions. So he was actually rather clever. So he came up with the idea of rather than modeling the motion of the planets in circles, you can imagine the curve that it traces out when you model it as a circle moving along another circle. So it traces out the loops in space. It's just called an epicycle. So this is a rather ingenious, although rather naive idea, at least as we think of it today. But uh, at the time it was rather interesting. And also something very interesting about this model is that it survived into the millennia, like really, really several years after it was first proposed. So here on the right, you see a picture that I took from Wikipedia. It's, it's from a book, Cosmographia. This is um, Bartoloveu Velo, who was a Portuguese cartographer in the 16th century. So you see that this model was actually used even in the 16th century for navigational purposes and just for you know, cartography. So this is a rather interesting thing. Not even Newton had this luxury of his theory surviving more than 200 years until Einstein came along. So it's a rather interesting point. Um, so it was not until Copernicus, Nicolas Copernicus, who published his work in 1543 that this idea that the Earth should be at the center of the universe was challenged. So he put the sun at the center of the universe. So this is a heliocentric model. So this was a complete revolution at the time. I mean, it really, I mean, you probably all heard in school, you know, this is one of the first stories that we learned in school that Galileo Galilei, who was a pretty famous uh, scientist, astronomer at the time, really was one of the famous champions of his theory. But the Roman Inquisition at the time was uh, really, uh, you know, this contradicted Holy Scripture. So this was a heretical theory. So Galileo Galilei was tried and found to be a heretic and then spent the remaining days of his life in house arrest. So, well, I guess there's no good science without sacrifice. Yeah. Um, so what does this epicycles look like? So, you know, this was actually known to the old astronomers like in antiquity. So they, they observed the sky and recording the positions of the planets. They had tablets and things. So you observe this 
rather interesting motion. So this is a picture of Mars as it moves in the night sky, and it's pictures taken at regular times, uh, interval times. Um, and you, you see that, you know, at some point it traces out this funny loop. This, this is the epicycle. Um, and it's also funny because Mars is coming in, in a certain direction, and then at some point it stops, and then it moves in the opposite direction, and then it stops again and continues the forward motion. So this is a very puzzling thing. How, how do you match this up with a perfect circle of motion, right? Um, so until the Copernican revolution, which one can think is a change of coordinates, so you change the origin of the universe to a different point, uh, this was a puzzle and a mystery for the astronomers in the day. Um, so nowadays, I mean, we can understand this is basically taking what the correct sort of trajectories of the, of the planets we consider to be, and then sort of use this change of coordinates. This is the kind of curve that you can describe even mathematically, but this wasn't known until then. So it was not until Johannes Kepler, who was a, another famous name in the story, published his work Astronomia Nova in 1609, that the laws of planetary motion as we today understand to be correct were sort of delivered. Um, so Johannes Kepler at the time was an assistant to another pretty renowned astronomer, Tycho Bray. Um, so Bray had his own version of a, of a model for the solar system. It was roughly speaking a combination of a geocentric and a heliocentric model. And Bray was able to use this model in order to make what at the time was considered the most accurate astronomical predictions. So he had a lot of let's say, numbers and sort of uh, calculations and things. So Kepler had all this information, which was very valuable at the time, available to him. So what he managed to do is to use his empirical observations and come up with a, with a model that accurately matched the empirical observations. So, so he came up with what today we, we know as the loss of planetary motion. Um, so what is this loss of planetary motion? Let me tell you a bit about them. So the first law, there's, there's three laws. So the first law says that the orbit of a planet is not exactly a circle as was thought of before, but it's an ellipse. And the sun should be at one of the two foci. So an ellipse is a rather oblong version of a perfect circle. And it comes with two distinguished points, like in the picture, which are called the foci, and the sun should lie in one of them. So you should imagine if the ellipse is degenerated into a perfect looking circle, then those two points coincide at the center of and you know, they are just one point. So this is a more general geometric description of the, for the motion of the planets. And it's actually what we consider today to be the correct way of thinking about planetary motion when there's only two bodies in our system. So if our solar system consisted of only two bodies, which of course it's not correct, but this is what would happen. The, pre, the, motion, the motion would be forever periodic and everything will be very stable and very pretty. Um, so this is a geometric description for the motion of the planets. But the second law says something a bit more uh, about how the planet traces out this orbit in space as time evolves. So it says something along the following lines. So if you take the line segment that joins the planet and the sun, so that's just a line segment, and, and, you, and you look at the region that it sweeps out as it moves around in space. So this, as in the picture, traces out some region. And what the law says is that the area of this region is the same uh, if we let equal intervals of time pass, okay? So in other words, if you, if you are looking at a planet and you have a photograph and you take pictures at the same intervals of time and you look at those regions, they will always keep the same area. So this is saying, saying something actually quite interesting. Um, if you look at the picture, the region to the right of the sun is actually sort of wider than the other ones. Uh, so it, it's telling you that the sun, sorry, the planet, the closer it is to the sun, the faster it will have to move in order to trace the same area as the other regions. So this is something, more, it says more information of what actually is going on, not only just the geometry of the situation. So you can see this interesting phenomena in, in the video. So what you should observe is that the closer the planet is to the center, which is where you should think the sun is, then the faster it moves. So that the area of all these triangles stays the same. Okay? So this is the second law of Kepler. And the third law is something about more quantitative. It tells you something about numbers associated to the trajectory. So if you look at the orbital period, so this is the time t that the planet takes in order to make a whole turn around the sun. So you can imagine the, the Earth takes 365 days to do so. Um, and if you look at, a, at what's called the length of the semi-major axis, so that's 
a technical term for just you look at this red segment here um, and that's the semi-major axis and you look at its length which is called a so what the third loss is that it's squared of, of the time of the orbit um, is proportional to the cubed of a okay so this is some sort of law about numbers really but it's saying also something quantitative about something which is rather intuitive which is the further away the planet is from the sun so the larger this a is the, the slower it moves so in particular the longer time it will take to perform the whole motion so the larger t will be okay so this is some numerical uh, observation that he just wrote down in order to match what he was was seeing in the in the observations so this was all purely numerical so you know which is rather amazing though so he wrote down his three laws without having any theory whatsoever it's just to match the observation of his of his uh, mentor so isaac newton and you know you probably have heard of him um, in 1685 1687 he wrote what's probably what's probably one of the most famous works in, in all of science so the principia mathematica um, so what newton does here among several things you know he comes up with the law of motion that we study when we're in school when, when we take our first course in physics right so it tells you that the force that we exert on a particle like a planet should equal the acceleration times the mass of, of the planet. Right? So this is, of course, very well known. But at the time, it was, of course, like some fantastic sort of basic principle that Newton was able to discover. And he used these basic principles in order to derive analytically, using formulas, the loss of planetary motion of Kepler that he had derived only empirically. Okay? So, you know, Newton, in some sense, sets out not only the language that we use today, but also the most basic analytical tools that we have for doing science, like in mathematics. One of the things that Newton observes is that, you know, we can model the motion of the planets as what, as were what is called conic sections. So imagine that you take a plane and you intersect it with a cone, that you get a bunch of curves, and those curves are called conics. Uh, and you, you can have different types. You can have a circle, of course, but you also have the ellipse. But if you also allowed uh, those which are not, uh, you know, bounded, so they go off to infinity, um, those also model the motion of, of planets. You should imagine like an asteroid coming from very, very far away and then near the Earth, and it's deflected and then it sort of continues. So this is the type of motion that this models. You can also have a line. Imagine like the, the, it's an asteroid that it's so far away that it's not really affected by the gravity of Earth. So it's just continuous straight. So gravity is, is, called, is said to be a weak force. It sort of decays very fast the, the, the further away the planets are. Okay, so this is a beautiful geometric observation. It's, I would say it's one of the most basic fundamental facts of mathematics as, be, as being able to model uh, nature, like the motion of the planets in this case. So, you know, with this geometric considerations, one usually says having Kepler's law tells us a lot about the two-body problem. We more or less understand what the two-body system looks like. So while the focus of Newton was on force uh, that one exerts on the, on the particles, um, Newtonian mechanics in that sense turns out to be equivalent to a different approach, which is called the variational method. So this was a sort of uh, based on the what's called the principle of least action or minimization of energy. So what Lagrange and Hamilton later observed in some sense is that nature wants to minimize energy. So the motion of the planets will not be arbitrary, but it will choose the motion that it somehow is cheaper. So it will minimize effort or energy in this case. So there's some notion of energy associated to a system, which is some number that you can compute for each initial position and velocity of the planets. And that number should be preserved as the motion evolves. Okay, so this is Hamilton's basic idea. And this is one of the most um, foundational ideas that we still use today. And also one of, one of the main things to take away from the Lagrange and Hamilton formalism is that they, they not only tell us that it's important to look at the position of the planet, but it's also important to look at its velocity. So we, we don't work just on the configuration space of the positions, but we work on what's called the phase space, which is the pairs of positions and velocity. So it's of some higher dimensional space associated to it. Okay. Okay, so this was a discussion more or less on the two-body problem. So we, we, we say that we really understand what's going on, roughly speaking. But what happens when we are the third bodies? 
what happens if we look at the three body problem and more bodies you know we have more planets in the system so we're trying to understand what's going on uh, more generally but let me show you what could happen when you add a third body to the system so these are three bodies in space and at some point they start tracing out some geometrically beautiful and pleasing trajectory but at some point this gets perturbed and they start doing some funky thing and you know if you look at this and you're trying to predict anything, uh, I, I, I presume you will be immediately puzzled as the astronomers back then were. I mean, this has no apparent structure. It's not a circle, it's not an ellipse. I mean, what is it? So it really tells you something about the chaotic behavior of the system. So this word chaos that, you know, Helmut has used and, you know, people th throw around, um, is actually something that actually means something concrete in, in mathematics and physics. And that word and also the three body problem is also attached to a famous name, which is that of Henri Poincaré. So Poincaré, he was a scientist, let's say, but he was at the time considered, it's sometimes he's considered to be the last universalist. So this means that he was able really to do everything. So he, he was a mathematician, he, did a, he was interested in physics, engineering, and he even wrote papers on philosophy. He was like a very sort of broad, guy. But amongst other things, he worked on the three-body problem, and his name is famously attached to it. And as the story goes, he became interested because of the following reason. So as the story goes, um, in 1885, there was this mathematician in Sweden called Gustav Metak Leffler. Um, and he, because of the of the, he had founded a, a mathematical journal, which is called Acta Mathematica. So Acta is still survives today, and it's probably one of the most prestigious journals uh, in which one can publish the work. Um, and at the time, Mittag Leffer, because of the occasion of the King of Sweden's 60th birthday, King Oscar, he decided to set out a price. So whoever was able to solve a concrete problem in mechanics, then that person would win some money and then the, the, the person, this person would have their work published in, in Acta Mathematica and sort of uh, um, distributed worldwide. So the problem, is, as Mittag Leffer proposed it, is the following. Given a system of arbitrarily many mass points that attract each other according to Newton's law, so imagine a bunch of planets, try to find a representation of the coordinates of each point as a series whose values converge uniformly. So this is a rather technical way of saying something very simple, which is, Given a bunch of planets, give me a function of time that will tell me precisely at any values of time in the future, precisely where each of those bodies will be, okay? Like an ellipse. Um, so what's interesting about the way that Mittag Leffert formulated the problem is that um, it really tells us about how people were trying to approach the problem at the time. So what they were trying to do is they were trying to express the position of each planet as an infinite sum of, infinitely many terms and then they had to deal with issues of convergence so this infinite sum needs to give us some sort of finite number uh, that tells us where the planet will be so a lot of people like newton and, and, and poincare approached the problem by this method so this is uh, precisely what this problem was trying to um what meta clever was, was asking for some serious representation but I think one of the bigger questions and which is still relevant today is out of the stability question so one of the one of the questions that we're trying to understand, and it's a very natural question, is whether the solar system remains stable over infinite amounts of time. So in other words, will the periodic motion that we see on a daily basis stay periodic forever? Or will it be true that in, in some several million, million years, will the moon collide against the earth? Hopefully not. Uh, will Saturn be ejected to infinity and lost from the solar system? I mean, this type of catastrophic phenomena. So I, I think you should agree that this is a very worrying type of situation that we would rather be able to prove mathematically does not happen, okay? So it's not surprising that this was a motivating problem at the time. Um, so as the story goes, Poincaré published a sort of, he sent his work to Mittag Leffer, it was published, he won the prize, won some money, and then he was claiming that the three-body problem was stable in some sense. Um, and it turns out that there was a mistake in his work. Um, so this, you know, Metak Leffer was very embarrassed and so was Poincaré. So, you know, they traced out all the published versions of Poincaré's work, and then they paid more money than the prize money to get them back. Um, and then sort of Poincaré started working on the problem again. 
and he actually managed to fix the mistake. And people say, you know, in this process of fixing the mistake, the modern theory of dynamical systems came to be, or in other words, chaos was discovered. So the result of this story was published in three tomes in 1892 in French. So in French, this is the new methods of the selection mechanics. And one of the main messages of this whole work, there's a lot of mathematics and science in, into this. Many of the most basic tools that we use today can be traced to this work. So it's rather a fantastic piece of science. Um, but one of the main messages of this work is that as opposed to the two-body problem, Poincaré can prove mathematically that the three-body problem does not admit explicit solutions. Okay, so you not be able to come up with a, with a way of reducing the number of variables in your problem and sort of solve the problem. Um, and moreover, it has chaotic dynamics in a, in a fairly well-defined sense. So there's a notion to define chaos uh, precisely, and then Poincaré sort of discovered that in this case. So there's a bit of a, there's a bit of historical sort of, a bit, I wouldn't say a bit of a lie here because after the work of Poincaré, there was this mathematician and astronomer Sundman, and he was able to actually write down one of these infinite sums that describes the positions of all the planets and as actually an honest to God solution to the three body problem, according to what Mittag Leffer was asking. But the problem with that solution is that it converges so slowly that it's no use for any sort of practical purpose whatsoever. Um, and it does not directly contradict what Poincaré is telling us because Poincaré, you know, he was trying to approach the problem with what's called reduction of variables. So you have some very big dimensional space, you know, this phase space of positions and velocities. And then there, there's some energy function that you try to reduce according to all the, the quantities that stays constant along the motion. So you try to reduce as, as much as possible your variables. So what Poincaré tells us is that you cannot do that in this problem. But Sunman actually gives some infinite series. And this is a rather technical point, but I think the consensus nowadays is that the approach that we're trying to use at the time of this infinite series is not the correct one for this particular problem. So it's still, I mean, it doesn't give us any new insights or, or any new dynamical information. So in order to at least give you an impression of what chaos can look like, I need to tell you a bit about one of Poincaré's uh, beautiful ideas, which is this idea of a local section or, or return map. So this will be rather technical, but uh, hopefully not so much. So you usually imagine like you, you have your planet moving around. Um, let's assume that the planet is moving on a plane, okay? Just for simplicity. So we keep track of its position with a two-dimensional thing. And then we also keep track of the velocity is another two-dimensional thing. So we're looking at a four-dimensional space and that's hard to see. But inside that space, there's an energy that stays preserved. So we look at the energy of constant, surface of constant energy. So that's a three-dimensional object. It's a pretty abstract thing. And inside this three-dimensional space, our planet is moving, okay? So we're looking at that. So this is what the picture is supposed to be representing. And inside this three-dimensional space, imagine that you have a plane. So like, like in the picture, it's a two-dimensional object with the property that it intersects each orbit. So you, you start locally with an orbit, of this point Z, and then you just let it move. And then at some point you look at the first return point where it comes back to the plane. And you call that point P of Z. So this defines for your correspondence, where so it takes Z to P of Z. So that's just a map, but it's a discrete object. So the idea of this whole return map is that it takes a continuous ambient three-dimensional dynamics and then reduces it to a two-dimensional sort of discrete thing. It, you're iterating a map. You're taking a point, mapping it to another point, and then mapping that new point to another one, and so on. So what this gives us is some sort of pattern in two, dimen in, in two dimensions. So this is what this picture is trying to represent. And this pattern encodes all of the complexity of the dynamics. Okay, so this is like the basic idea of a, of a local section. This is actually used in engineering nowadays, and every sort of a prime mathematician is familiar with this sort of idea. And just for the purpose of, of impression, let me, hello, yeah. So just let me give you an impressionistic idea of what chaos looks like. So you look at one of these sections, and let me, let me show you what a typical return map can look like. So you can sort of have so at least some impression of what, what's going on. So what you see in a typical return map you could have what's, what's called this island of stability. So imagine a bunch of circles, one inside the other one. And, the, oops. and then when you apply Poincaré's map, that this island might be mapped to another island. And then this island might be mapped to another island. And then at some point, it may come back. So you have, you'll see the sort of this periodic type of picture. And surrounding those islands, you might see the circles in green. 
which are uh, where the map is roughly speaking a rotation. So each point in that circle gets mapped to another point in the same circle in sort of a rotation. And in between those islands, you might see these regions where you have what's called a hyperbolic dynamic. So it's expanding in some direction and contracting in the other one. And if you zoom in, and this is what Poincaré actually found in the three-body problem, you see a very, very complicated pattern. You see what's called a homoclinic tangle. So it's a tangle of where you, you see all this chaos. And people say usually that you have chaotic motion when you see this type of picture in your, in your dynamics, okay? And in between you have some uh, a sea of noise which doesn't have any apparent structure. So this is a type of picture that Poincaré was dealing with. Of course, this was much later produced using computers. It, it, this wasn't really available to Poincaré at the time, but you know, just to give you an idea of what we're actually dealing with. Okay, but one of the basic things that you can do when I give you a system like a bunch of planets is look at what, what's called periodic orbits. So Poincaré was already interested in this. So a periodic orbit is just a solution to the equations of motion that after some time, return to the same position and velocity. So you should imagine like an ellipse in the two-body system. So those, it turns out they exist in more complicated situations. And Poincaré thought of them, that what makes this periodic solution so precious to us is that they are the only opening through which we can try to enter a place which up to now was deemed inaccessible. So of course, periodic orbits are a mathematical idealization in some sense. It's not true in real life that planets come back to precisely the same point with the same velocity. They come back perhaps nearby, right? But mathematically, um, understanding periodic orbits will help us understand everything else. And so Poincaré thought of them as being the skeleton of the dynamics. So not, because, not only because they model the motion of the moon, you know, as we see it in the sky and other planets, but also because they help us understand mathematically other types of phenomena. So this inspired at the time what's a very classical result so Poincaré proposed an idea of trying to mathematically prove that periodic orbits exist in the systems. And he looked at one of this, he found a cylinder in the space and then sort of reduced the whole situation to look at a map of the cylinder and said, if this map satisfies some conditions then there should be infinitely many periodic orbits. This was Poincaré's idea. And then he proved it in certain cases and Birkhoff took it up later after Poincaré died and proved the general case. So this became the poincaré birkhoff theorem, which is a very, very, classical and beautiful result uh, that traces to the three body problem. And then it was used, this type of ideas were used math in mathematics in many different situations, it's called fixed point theory. Um, so nowadays um, it's, it's, it's a very sort of, let's say um, classical way of thinking about this type of problems. Um, and in terms of chaos, I mean, I will not go into the details of what these tangles uh, are, but let me just show you a picture. So this is, Roughly speaking, what they look like, this was what Poincaré observed as being in the three-body problem. Um, this, what Poincaré said is that these intersections form a kind of mesh of fabric of infinite, infinitely tight network. One will be struck by the complexity of this figure, which I did not even try to draw. So he doesn't even draw this picture in his book. Um, nothing is more likely to give us an idea of the complexity of the three-body problem. So, you know, the, this trajectory is, you know, they, they form this sort of really intricate patterns. And you know, we say mathematically, many people define the notion of chaos whenever you see this type of picture in your system. Okay, so this is the definition, if you want, of what chaos theory is. And you know, this this was studied by many people afterwards. Uh, most notably, there was the work of uh, Stephen Smale, uh, who found a model for the dynamics near one of these tangles. Uh, he be this became known as the horseshoe, the Smales horseshoe, and then other people realized that you can encode this dynamics using symbolic dynamics, using symbols, what's called symbolic dynamics. So imagine you 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 have words and, and letters that in some sense describe the itineraries of each point, and then you can plug it into a computer and you learn information about your system. So that's roughly speaking the idea. So this really was, uh, in some sense, inspired a lot of mathematics that came after. Okay, so let me let me tell you a bit about what symplectic geometry is supposed to be. So symplectic geometry, which is well the field where I started, I started doing my research, um, it's directly inspired by mechanics and in particular, the end body problem. Um, so it's a branch of mathematics, which nowadays is very active and uh, has, you know, has uh, in some sense used 
uh, tools from several different other areas of mathematics and physics. So the idea is uh, we look at a moving particle. Imagine you, you, you have a planet moving in some space. And as I told you, you not only want to look at the position space, but you also want to look at the space of velocity. So you consider the pairs of position and velocities, and you look, look at the collection of all those possible things. So that's called phase space. So this was already known to be useful to the likes of Lagrange and, and Hamilton, as I said. Symplectic geometry, roughly speaking, as a mathematical discipline, one can say that it's the study of the geometry of all possible phase spaces, of all, all the global shapes of all possible phase spaces for all possible mechanical systems. This is a rather ambitious thing to try to do. But as mathematicians, you know, we tend to study things in general. So we want to learn general principles about all possible situations. So this is what we do. Um, so much of the field is trying to deal abstractly with, you know, tr try to understand geometrical properties of, of the spaces, which in general can be rather complicated. So first of all, you know, as, as we observed before, they're high dimensional. You know, if you have a particle, if you have a planet moving in three dimensional space, you consider the position, but you also consider the velocity. So you're dealing with six dimensions. That's, that's a lot of dimensions. And then if you had more planets, so imagine you have N planets, then you're looking at space of six times N dimensions. So, I mean, it's really a monster of, of, of an idea. And it's, it's amazing that it's actually useful. Um, but of course, it's are hard to visualize in practice, right? So, um, so the whole game of simplex geometry is to try to develop methods in order to understand the global properties of the spaces. So in this context, um, Arnold, who was a Russian mathematician in the 20th century, um, he conjectured in the, late, in the late 70s that if you give me any phase space, so some collection of positions and velocities for some particles, and you take any system on it, so you take any mechanical system on it, which can describe whatever physics, then that system should admit at least as many periodic orbits as a number which depends only on the global shape of the phase space. Okay, so this is saying you give me a space in the abstract, and I don't care about the dynamics. I just look at the space, and then if you put any dynamics on it, then there has to be periodic orbits, and there have to be as many as this number, which depends only on the original space. So this is a rather surprising fact, and so it was a conjecture at the time. It's a rather, uh, let's say, very general statement to make. For example, for a cylinder, which is what Poincaré was looking at, where he was looking at the three-body problem, this number is actually two, just a number two. Um, so the Arnold conjecture is a generalization of this classical poincaré birkhoff theorem that I mentioned to you, this poincaré last geometric theorem. So this conjecture was directly inspired on the three-body problem, I can say. So as a, as a very vast generalization of, of the stuff that Poincaré was trying to achieve. Um, and this was, you know, in the field of symplectic geometry, there was, people usually say that there was a particular year which was uh, uh, revolutionary. This is 1985. So in that year, Gramov published a paper um, and he introduced the notion of what's called a pseudo-holomorphic curve. So I will not get into the details of what this means, but you, you could imagine like you have a phase space, you're trying to understand the global geometry of this. And imagine that you do so by looking at surfaces, like two dimensional objects inside this high dimensional thing. And they come in families and they tend to sort of sweep out the entire space. And in some sense, they test the global shape, the global geometry of the very high dimensional space. So that's a very rough idea of what the Sulomorphic curve is trying to do. And they also interact very nicely with every dynamics that you put in this space. And then not so long after Gromov's paper, Andreas Fleur managed to prove in the late 80s Arnold's conjecture. Okay, So he managed to prove uh, this uh, fact that uh, there has to be at least as many periodics as some number. And while doing so, he introduced a host of new mathematical ideas that are quite uh, surprising and, and rather deep. Um, this gave rise to what's called Fleur theory. So I will also not go much into the details of what Fleur theory is, but you can imagine that you have some space, so uh, some phase space, and rather than looking at all the periodic orbits of some system, you look at all the space of loops. So just circles in my space. They can be whatever circle. They don't have to be a trajectory of some, some uh, planet or anything. So that's an infinite dimensional space of circles. And inside this infinite dimensional space, 
he writes a function, which is, a, you know, it tells you, for example, some, you could look at the length of this loop. It's not exactly what he did, but ima imagine that. And this function has critical points. So those points where the derivative of the function is zero. And those critical points correspond to periodic orbits. So he was able to come up with analytical tools in order to analyze these critical points and show that they have to be as many as something which depends only on the shape of your original phase space. So this was rather amazing. So fluid theory, I mean, the combination of fluid theory and holomorphic curves nowadays in symplectic geometry is what we consider the most basic toolkit. So we really use them on a daily basis in our work. Uh, it was not only important for mechanics and, and, and geometry, but also for other fields of mathematical physics like gauge theory, which is inspired by, or let's say it, it's inspired by electro electromagnetism as uh, Maxwell's equations. This was uh, also rather, um, rather revolutionary. And using this uh, available toolkit, so Helmut Hofer, who uh, is sitting there and uh, he introduced me wonderfully today, um, so Helmut Hofer developed what he calls symplectic dynamics. So this is a combination of symplectic geometry and dynamics. So one can think of it as an interdisciplinary framework to address problems in dynamics and symplectic geometry and to revisit old problems like the three-body problem uh, from a modern perspective, but also ask new questions, right? So this is a framework in which we can try to use the tools that Fleur gave us and Gromo gave us in order to sort of try to answer um, questions, all questions about uh, classical problems, but also to, you know, look into the future in a way. Um, maybe Helmut can say later what, what he thinks about some like dynamics, but for example, one of, one of the things that came out from this whole story is that Helmut worked with one of some of our collaborators, Vizalski and Zander, um, and they managed to introduce tools which are called finite energy foliations. I uh, will not say much about what they are, but they're directly uh, using this theory of Gromov. Um, and, th and those tools can be used in a three-body problem to obtain sort of really nice decompositions of the spaces which interact nicely with the dynamics. Um, and they can be used in order to um, try to understand what's going on in these problems. Okay. So that's so much for the theory. I mean, the, there's a lot of theory that has directly been inspired by this particular problem alone. But, you know, this is a problem that no, it's not only interesting theoretically, but also for practical purposes. So one of the nice applications of this is space exploration, okay? Imagine that you're NASA and then you have a lot of money um, to put uh, or try to put a spacecraft in orbit. So you send your spacecraft and imagine that you're trying to send it to uh, some system, which some planet, which comes with a moon. So you can model that as a three body problem. So with one of the bodies is a satellite, the other one is the planet, and the other one is the moon. Of course, the satellite, when you compare it to the other two, is negligible, so it has no mass. So this is called the restricted three-body problem. One of the masses is zero. So this is already a problem that Poincaré studied. At the time, he didn't have the modern motivation for us. We are now in the space age, so this is much more relevant uh, for practical purposes than it was back then. Um, but now a new host of interesting questions pop up. So chaos has been known since Poincaré, but you know, really it only has been used very recently in the 90s for practical applications. So chaotic dynamics, as Helmut was saying, is not something that the engineers like to hear. Um, so in this direction, Edward Bruno, as, uh, as Helmut has uh, already, he gave, basically gave a, a bunch of, of, of my own talk. Um, so in 1990, Edward Bruno, when he, correct, he can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but at the time he was working at JPL, so the Jet Propulsor Laboratory in, in Pasadena. And so he used his chaotic motions discovered by Poincaré to save the Japanese lunar probe Hitton, which has suffered a failure. So it lacked the fuel to enter lunar orbit. So there was some problem and they didn't have enough fuel to do the mission that, that they had to do. Um, so they came up to Ed, who, who was known as a mathematician uh, to study this sort of crazy, uh, chaotic motions. Um, and so he came up with a particularly sort of complicated trajectory, but which used very little fuel in order to put the, the probe in, in orbit and actually save the mission. Okay, so this became a legend after that. Um, so it, it's based on what, what Ed calls balli ballistic capture trajectories. Anyway, so nowadays, um, there's uh, NASA believes that there might be life outside of the Earth, so it was one of the 
there, there are two candidate moons in our solar system that are thought of as being uh, perhaps candidates for harboring conditions for, for life. This is, this is the Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter, and, and Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn. So this is an icy moon. There's a lot of ice, there's a lot of water. Um, so in principle, there might be conditions for the presence of life. So in particular, uh, NASA is assigning a spacecraft, which is called the Europa Clippers. The, the, the will launch in the near future and, 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 and go to Europa. So this, of course, motivates theoretical studies, in particular studies for periodic orbits for the purposes of optimization. So you want to send your satellite, you want to park it in, in, in some periodic motion around the moon. So you need to study all possible um, periodic trajectories. And then you want to choose which one is best for whatever you want to do. So perhaps, you know, first, first of all, you, you need to have a host of practical considerations to take into account. You, you want to minimize the use of fuel because it's very, very expensive. You want to minimize the time that it takes you to get there. Um, you also want to maximize safety. You don't want your satellite to crash against the surface of the moon uh, because you would lose a lot of resources. Um, but maybe you also want your orbit to have good communication with the Earth. So you don't want to, it to be sort of blocked between the moon and, and the planet. So there are all sorts of things that you, that you want from a practical perspective. Then from a theoretical perspective, what you do is you, you come up with an algorithm that spits orbits, and then you, want, you choose amongst them which, uh, which is the best to find. But in order to find orbits, there's a lot of theoretical tools that come into that. So this is an ongoing, this motivates an ongoing collaboration that I have with Urs Frauenfelder, who's a mathematician in Oxford in Germany, and Dayon Ko, who's a navigational engineer at NASA. Uh, so the way that this um, collaboration came to be, so I, I, I had been working on the three-body problem from the theoretical perspective. So I wrote a survey of some of the results that we managed to obtain with um, Otto van Kurt, who's uh, one of my collaborators in, in Seoul, in South Korea. Um, so I wrote this paper and then sort of Dayoung read it and she approached me because um, she, with her team, were interested in studying families of periodic orbits for the systems. Um, and, but they, what they do is they study them in families. They don't look at just one orbit. They look at families of them. Imagine like there's an energy, as Hamilton told us, of the system, and then we move the energy. So when we move the energy, we, we, we see cylinders of orbits. Okay, so that's a family of periodic orbits. And what could happen is that at some point, one of those orbits spits out another orbit. This is called a bifurcation. And there's another orbit, that, and then you also want to follow. Okay. And in order to understand what type of bifurcations you have, this is where the math comes, comes in. Um, so the motivating problems are classification. So we want to determine when two periodic orbits can be connected by a family. So if you give me two abstract orbits, is there a family of orbits between them? So one says that they're qualitatively, they look the same. We want to refine existing methods for cataloging families of orbits. Um, and we also want to use simplex geometry for practical purposes. So simplex geometry is a very theoretical, mathematical uh, discipline, and we want to extract uh, tools from it that can be implemented for practical purposes. So that's one of the, let's say, big directions that we'd like to pursue. And this is, of course, harder to do than to say. Um, but we do have results, so this is a good thing. So with Urs Frauenfelder, what we managed to do is we introduce a general mathematical framework to study orbits and families refining existing methods from the engineers. So we have a whole toolkit. Um, and in particular, we introduce numerical invariants directly from FLIR theory. Remember FLIR from the 80s, uh, which serve as practical tests for the algorithm. So I told you we're interested in bifurcations. Uh, and these are just numbers that you can associate to a periodic orbit. And the property that they have, and this is crucial, is that they stay the same before and after bifurcation. So this is a mathematical statement that one can prove it's pretty hard, but once you have that, you can use it. Um, so this number should stay the same before and after. So if your algorithm is finding orbits, you can compute those numbers easily in the computer. And if they agree, then you're happy because they should. But if they differ, then you know that you missed an orbit. So your algorithm has to keep on looking. Okay, so this is a way to use um, tools directly taken from abstract theories for practical purposes. Also with Earth, but now with Dayong, with the engineer, we use the above mathematical framework for concrete numerical studies of periodic orbits in the Jupiter Europa and Saturn and Calidus system. So we're using the, the, the toolkit 
for numerical studies. So Dayong is producing a bunch of orbits and then we're sort of testing them against the theory and it matched. We produced uh, a paper already out of this, um, not two papers out of this, and there's another one in the workings. Um, so in, in progress with Urs and also with Dayong, and now we added a student, Zengiz Aydin. He is a, he is a PhD student in Lausanne in Switzerland, working with Felix Schlenk. So we are studying families of periodic orbits in the systems using methods from symplectic geometry. So we have a bunch of index theory and we have uh, new tools and we're trying to see whether we can use them for producing new periodic orbits. Okay. So let me finish you know, this talk by saying something which, um, well, it's both good and bad in some sense. So despite the centuries and our best efforts and the, I would say the efforts of the most brilliant minds like Newton and Poincaré and Kepler and all of these people, the three-body problem, I would say, remains poorly understood. So we know quite a bit, but we also don't know much more than what we do know. Um, so this is bad in some sense, but it's also good because it will probably inspire future generations. Uh, it continues to be a case study against which to test theoretical and practical tools. So this is a, whenever science evolves, what you'd like to do is you want to take the tools that you have newly at your disposal and try to test them against old problems and see whether you can get new information. And then it's also a test for the tool. You know that your tool is useful or something. So um, nowadays we have some new tools. We're trying to test them. Um, we'll probably be limited in our results and this will continue to be food for thought for, for future generations, hopefully. So thank you very much for listening. You had uh, you you had uh, the, the the space Q that was both uh, position and velocity, but if you go back to Newton, who says that you know gravity is a function of the masses, that, you know divided by the distance squared. Why don't you have mass in there? Be, you know of the of the other two bodies that I guess you're trying to get the third body into an orbit around. If I understood correctly, you're asking how do we deal with the masses in this problem? Mm -hmm. Correct. So one of the bodies we should say that has no mass, right? That's a satellite. So it drops out of the equations, if you want. And the other ones have masses, and there's two masses associated. And then we look at what's called the mass ratio. So we just take a quotient. So we take the product and divide by the sum. So that's just some number. So it's a mass parameter in the problem. And this is how we we put both of them together in one number, so that's one of the one of the two parameters in the problem. The other one is the energy, so we're dealing with sort of two parameters and we're studying the systems varying them. So what if if you give me one specific mass parameter that corresponds to a specific system, like for example Moon Earth, and then other values will give you different systems. Does that answer the question? Hi, thanks for a nice talk. Um, so yeah, for a practical application, you're considering the uh, restricted or reduced free, free body problems where one mass is almost zero. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, uh, what does this make more tractable in your problems and what is actually still open? And how does this interplay with flare theory and symplectic dynamics? Okay, so let me try to answer the question. So um, the way that this simplifies, so the way that practical, in practical ways that this assumptions simplify the problem is that, for example, when you look at the Hamiltonian describing system to the energy function, it's, it doesn't depend on time. So you can change coordinates. If you also assume that the, the big masses and something that we do assume that they move in circles. So we, we go back to Ptolemaeus and we actually assume that they move in circles, which is an approximation of the actual problem. Uh, so if we assume that, then the Hamiltonian becomes time independent. So it's conserved. So this reduces the dimension of the problem. So you start with the six dimensional phase space, when you fix the energy, you have a fine dimensional phase space. And in there, um, you, you look at it, just one particle. Uh, and um, all, in the system, if you make those assumptions, there's also no triple collisions or anything. So you have, you have to deal only with binary collisions where the satellite crashes with one or the other one. So mathematically, you can do that. Uh, and the way that FERC theory comes in, well, um, 
So one of, you know, as I said, you know, Fleur was motivated by the Arnold conjecture, which is saying something about existence of periodic orbits. Um, so what we're trying to do is, so I didn't mention this, but in, in a paper with, the, with my collaborator, Otto von Kurt, we managed to reduce the problem even further to dimension four. Um, so now you have a global return map on a four dimensional object. And in, the, in that map, uh, you, you want to find periodic orbits for that map. And this is where Fleur theory is supposed to be useful for that. So we expect it to be, we expect to be able to prove that this type of maps have infinitely many periodic orbits, but there's some problems of what happens at the boundary. I mean, it's one of the directions that we're trying to pursue. There's a lot of technical problems um, in high dimensions. Um, so we proved the theorem in the spirit of the pointed de Birkhoff theorem, which is a generalization to high dimensions of this classical result. Uh, so it's an abstract result. We're trying to apply it to the problem that inspired it. So it, it's rather funny, like if you look at Poincaré Birkhoff, so it took 50 years until Conley actually applied it to the planar case. I, I hope that it doesn't take another 50 years for our theorem to be applied, but uh, you'll never know. Anyways, so I hope, hope I answered at least a bit of your question. I, I, listening to your talk, I was wondering if there is a solution allowed where we get ejected this planet before the sun explodes, which actually would be much better than being stable. Yeah, that's that's a so. There, I think there has been a lot of like uh, numerical simulations of of the stability of the solar system. Um, I don't know precisely about your question. I, I, I'm not the person to ask. But uh, I know that in some models, for example, it's not known whether Pluto or Mercury, I don't remember. Uh, it, it, there's, there's, with different parameters, there has been a lot of different scenarios. Sometimes they get ejected to infinity in, in, in sufficiently short amounts of time. Sometimes they stay stable. So I guess the answer is we don't really know what's going on. Um, um, as to your question, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry to say that I, I don't know. So the reason is it's chaos in the system. So the, 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 you want to make a calculation to design the size. So you need a lot of storage space. Unfortunately, there are only 10 to the 83 electrons in the universe. You know, the universe. And that's not enough. <laughs> so even if you turn the whole known universe into a computer, you're running out of memory. Well, my question is going to be um, far more basic and simple, since this is way beyond my ken in many ways. Uh, but uh, uh, we tend to think, based on what are essentially 3,000 Earth years of human observations, and then with telescopes, 400 years only, uh, and trying to to understand the, the universe from that. We tend to think now of the planetary orbits being on a single plane, although perhaps they are on wildly different planes. Uh, and one might imagine that to the extent that the tiny gravitational impact of this particular mass of planet X or planet Y might, if these are at different planes, be distorting or, or altering slightly or wobbling the orbit of one or of another of, of the bodies. Um, and um, we wonder, A, whether mathematically one can go to the beginning time to figure out how those orbits got established after the Big Bang. If I remember my Science <laughs> Times article in the New York Times about the Big Bang. And then secondly, and this goes actually to the last question, when the sun becomes a big red star and then goes dark, are we still going to have the same orbits going on of uh, around a dead sun, now dead planets? Or does the, the change in the composition of the center of this particular solar system affect the orbits of those things that are just circling around? Okay, so let me try to answer the first question. So uh, about this motion on the planes, right? So th this is a simplification in some sense. You, you can assume that if you give me two bodies like the Earth and the Moon, they move in a plane, right? And then you're trying to model the motion of a satellite anywhere, not only necessarily on that plane. 
Um, so I would say that the planar case of these problems, which is something that is studied, is a it's a toy model for the for the more complicated real situation in which not everything moves in the plane. So Poincaré looked at the planar case of the three-body problem just 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 to try to understand what's going on there in order to then jump to more complicated situations. Uh, so I would say uh, is a tool uh, looking at assuming that everything moves in the plane. You also have other systems which are actually moving in a plane. Like it also applies to other situations, like billiards, for example. You're looking at balls in a billiard table, so that moves in a plane. Um, but um, and, and as to your second question, yeah, I mean, if 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 the sun explodes and then you know becomes very small, the mass will change, and this will affect directly the gravitational pull that will have on the planets. So this will affect directly the motion of, of every other bodies in the system. So you can expect, I mean, I don't know what you can expect to happen, um, but certainly chaos. If the, if the sun explodes, you can assume that chaos will ensue, right? So I, we stop caring what happens with the planet afterwards. Okay, so let's wrap it up. So let's thank our speaker again.